So I will start by delaying the schedule just a slightly more. So since my last name starts with B, I have the honor of kicking off this gong show. And I would like, on behalf of all of us, thank the organizers for allowing us to, to speak even briefly at this uh, very, very fine event. Um, so now, so, and I hope these 30 seconds will be not you know, deducted from my, <laughs> to my talk. So in one sentence, um, what I, uh, my research goal is to understand the moduli space of two-dimensional superconformer field theory with at least 0,2 supersymmetry. Um, when the theory actually admits enhanced supersymmetry, namely 2,2, mirror symmetry has provided us beautiful insights into the corresponding <laughs> moduli space. So thinking geometrically, uh, this is a statement that a nonlinear sigma model on a Calabiao and its mirror yield uh, isomorphic conformal field theories. And certain subset of the moduli space gets exchanged, the A and B model, and we can think a little bit more generally about isomorphism between abstract conformal field theories. Now, the zero two generalization of this uh, implies, again, thinking geometrically, not only the manifold data need to be related, but uh, the mirror map ne needs to uh, also provide mirrors for some bundle data over the manifolds. Again, uh, we expect a certain subset of the moduli space gets exchanged, and we are confident that such a map should exist, at least in some cases, because again, thinking back on the 2-2 two -two case, we know that these theories admit a, um, a set of deformations which preserve only 0,2 supersymmetry. And if the two mirrors actually yield isomorphic of homophilic theory, then also they need to be isomorphic on this set of deformations. So for, in this case, we, are, we know that the 0 to ma map must exist. This has been worked out in some cases by um, by a few work, but details are still missing. So my personal strategy to tackle this kind of issue is to try to understand um, the, at least one side of, of the map for a larger class of models. Um, by now, you already are familiar with hybrid models. These are, uh, I've been working with, with, with my advisor, Plesser, uh, on, uh, on developing this for zero two theories, these generalized Lando Ginsburg theories and Linga Sigamoto and Calabiaos. And as Mauricio already um, summarized beautifully before, we completely solved the B model uh, for the, the zero two hybrids. And uh, I would like to stress that in particular, we saw that there are a subclass of these theories which are, uh, they sort of preserve some splitting in the moduli space. So uh, we see some mirror map. Thank you. Okay. In fact, the timing is perfect. So this is an excellent start. So, yes. Uh, Okay, please start. Thank you very much. Okay, so a few years ago, uh, Caldea IPMU have approved and funded the development of the ultra radio pure sodium iodide crystals, and uh, I'm glad to announce that uh, we have successfully developed such crystals. So this summer, we have produced uh, the new five per five inch crystal, and uh, the radiopurity level of our crystals is very close to the, the most radiopure in the world crystals uh, developed by Dama Libra. And our result, this one is not the latest one, because the latest one will be measured next month in Kamioka mine, but the previous results were very, very close to the Dama Libra results. So it's definitely success, even if we will compare with other experiments which tried to grow the same quality crystals. Uh, so, as uh, Nakahata Sensei has already mentioned today, the coherent uh, elastic neutrino nuclear scattering was observed for the first time only this year. Uh, it was done in spallation in neutron source in Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the United States. And uh, I should point out that this observation was done with only 14.5 kilograms of cesium iodide crystals. So, uh, 
we were discussing the installation of our sodium, ultra radio pure sodium iodide detectors to measure this process at the Spalachian neutron source in early 2018, but uh, this is uh, not the latest information. We decided to start the pilot experiment uh, with 12 kilograms of ultra radio pure sodium, not, natrium, uh, sodium iodide, sorry, sorry, crystals uh, in G Park facility. Of course, if you will take a look in the more further future, uh, there is a possibility that Isodar neutrino source facility will be built in Kamland uh, in early 2020s. So the large scale experiment by using this detector can be performed in Kamioka. But of course, uh, the first and the main purpose of this uh, development of these crystals was the dark matter search and in particular the uh, test of the Dama Libra observations. They claim that they observe the annual modulation of the dark matter as you well know and we would like to perform uh, the experiment. Uh, first phase uh, will start next year with the 54 kilograms of sodium iodide crystals. Here you can see the photos from the Kamioka underground laboratory where we have prepared uh, several supplementary detectors to measure and select the radio pure materials to control the uh, radon activity and neutron flux inside the mine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the next, please. Okay, so I'd like to tell you briefly about some work we've been doing recently on right-handed neutrino dark matter. So let me start with right-handed neutrinos. So perhaps one of the simplest and yet well-motivated extensions to the standard model is just to add three right-handed neutrinos. And this is quite an intuitive thing to do. It kind of, if you like, completes this picture that we have of the fermions in the standard model and puts the neutrinos on the same footing as all the other fermions. But more than that, you actually gain quite a lot by doing this. You add three standard model singlets and you can explain the smallness of neutrino masses via the seesaw mechanism and also generate the observed baryon asymmetry through leptogenesis. And actually, you can do both of these with only two very heavy right-handed neutrinos. And so that leaves you the interesting possibility that your lightest right-handed neutrino could be much lighter and possibly be a dark matter candidate. So if you want your, your right-handed neutrino to be dark matter, you need some way to produce it in the early universe. And one way you can do this is to charge it under some new gauge symmetry. So then the new gauge interactions mean that it's in thermal equilibrium in the early universe and your dark matter relic density can just be produced in the usual way via freeze out. So in principle, there's a number of different U1 symmetries you could consider here. We focused on one particular case, which is interesting for a number of reasons I don't have time to discuss, but this is a, a flavored U1 baryon minus lepton number symmetry. So this is uh, very much like the standard baryon B minus L symmetry you might have heard about, except that only the third generation of quarks and leptons are, are charged under this. And then this symmetry uh, should be spontaneously broken, and this also sets the, the mass scale for your right -hand neutrino dark matter, which is very broadly electroweak scale. So let me just briefly show you uh, some results or the kind of current status in this model. So this is one slice in the parameter space, and I've fixed the gauge coupling here so that you, everywhere in this plot, you satisfy the correct relic density. And really, the main thing I just wanted to highlight here is the complementarity of a number of different uh, ways you can go about searching and probing the parameter space of this model. So as you might expect, you have dark matter um, direct detection. You can look for gamma rays from dark matter annihilation. And then on the collider side, you have standard model precision measurements and direct LHC searches for the new gauge boson. And of course, there's a, a large range of parameter space here that's, that's still yet to be explored, and hopefully future experiments will test that. OK, thanks. like this one. Thank you. XY equals Z. Let me draw a graph of that. It's this uh, surface in three-dimensional space. And I want to draw your attention to the projection of this surface to the YZ plane, like so. Now, of course, 
This takes the x-axis to the origin in the yz plane. But apart from that, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So lines in the yz plane correspond to lines in the surface like this. The z-axis corresponds to some points out at infinity. And we traditionally include those as well. Now this is an example of a contraction. So it contracts the green line, leaves everything else alone. And the question I want to study, given a sub-variety, is it contractible? So this can be difficult, and it's important for classification of varieties. Now, I've been working on the complex case, um, where the variables are complex numbers, and in this case, the contraction is of a complex plane with a point at infinity, so a Riemann sphere. And even in this case, it's um, not easy to answer this question. So let me show you how I've been approaching it in the last few years. Start with a higher dimensional example. So, so these more complicated equations define a three-dimensional variety with two singular points of distance given by t equals 2. And this is a contraction of another variety with a pair of Riemann spheres in it. Now, let t go to 0, and these Riemann spheres collide to give a single Riemann sphere y. And that has an infinitesimal deformation left over from the collision. Now, it turns out that deformations like these determine contractibility. Let me show you how. But first, so this is an example of what's called a flopping contraction. And these things come with a mirror symmetry prediction that the B model on X has an interesting symmetry. So I made a mathematical analog of this. There is, for any three-fold flopping contraction, a certain algebra A, which controls these deformations. And I showed that A induces what's called a derived symmetry of this X. So this extended work of Yukinobu Toda and was joint with Michael Weems. Okay. So we extended this to higher dimensions. Take any Riemann sphere in an X, we want to ask whether a contraction exists. We extended this theorem under the assumption of crepancy and proved that if A is finite dimensional, then and only then is this Y contractible. Thank you. Uh, So, um, hi, and I'm Hajime Fukuda, a graduate student here, and today I'm going to talk about our ongoing work on the uh, detection of the outer light dark matters. So, um, as everyone here knows, uh, hopefully, um, the dark matter is uh, one of the most established new physics found so far, but still, wide range of mass region is available as uh, particle dark matter, and in this talk, I concentrate on the light half region, uh, namely, the dark matter whose mass is much lighter than the electron volt, like, say, 10 to minus 10 electron volt, for example. And uh, this kind of dark matter has many motivation and discussion, but I just simply skip them, and in this talk, I focus on the, uh, how we can detect them, in particular, the direct detection. Obviously, uh, since the dark matter is very light, the momentum transfer per one collision is very, very small. But now, since the uh, dark matter is very light, the number density of dark matter is very large, and the uh, total momentum transfer is rather not so small. And uh, we need to discuss which kind of target is appropriate to detect such a total momentum transfer. Here, the key point is that the quantum mechanical enhancement, and in particular, the coherent effect. So uh, what was the coherent effect? Probably the most elementary example on the coherent effect is the Coulomb scattering. Uh, where the cross-section is proportional to the charge squared instead of the charge itself. The reason is the following. 
Uh, here, the key point is the smallness of the momentum transfer. If the momentum transfer is small, then the uh, whole target interacts simultaneously, and the amplitude itself is proportional to the charge, and the cross-section is proportional to the charge squared. And actually, this smallness of the momentum transfer is also the case for the very light dark matter, obviously. And uh, here, uh, since the momentum transfer is very, very light, um, as the, um, the larger the target is, the uh, larger cross-section we have. So our conclusion is very clear. We can use the terrestrial bodies in solar system as a target for the auto light dark matter detection. Actually, uh, we can calculate the uh, quantum mechanical enhancement for the cross-section between dark matter and the sun. And using this enhanced, enhanced cross-section, uh, we have calculated the constraint and, and the uh, this is the figure. Unfortunately, we have found that uh, still we need one order more accuracy, but uh, we believe that uh, this method to use the terrestrial body as a target for all the light dark matter is interesting. So, thank you. Yes, uh, my recent research is on, on representations of framed braid groups. So let me explain what is a framed braid group. A framed braid group is a mathematical object which describes um, braiding and twists of ribbons. And by combining these two fundamental pictures, we can describe more complicated um, braiding or ribbon, uh, twists of ribbons. But um, the definition of a framed group is too abstract, so basically the problem is how to study the framed braid group. The answer is to consider representations of the framed braid groups. So representation implies to represent the group as an algebra of matrices. Then our problem, uh, problems are translated into problems of the linear algebra, then we can solve many problems. So my main result is, uh, so there are representations of the framed grade group constructed from the geometry of this surface. And, but actually, we need to use a homology group of this surface. By using this geometry, we can construct um, representations of frame to grade groups. So, uh, graphically, my representation is con constructed like <laughs> such pictures. So, vectors can be uh, described by using such complicated picture. And on vectors, uh, frame to group acts uh, upper pictures. And actually, my <laughs> And my research is motivated by the study of um, conformal field theory with irregular singularities. Yeah. Okay, thank you for attention. So uh, our study aims at uh, constraining the nature of the very first generation of stars in the universe based on uh, old and metal deficient stars in our Milky Way galaxy. <coughs> so uh, the first stars are the uh, first luminous objects in the universe uh, which have provided a large amount of ionizing photons for the cosmic realization and have uh, produced uh, heavy elements for the first time in the universe, uh, which were essential for subsequent uh, formation of the first galaxies. Um, however, the nature of the first stars uh, were quite uh, unknown, mainly because it's not possible to directly observe them. So the only observational constraint at this moment comes from so-called extremely metal pole stars in our galaxy, uh, which uh, are likely formed out of gas primarily enriched with heavy elements produced by supernova explosions of the first stars. So in our study, uh, we uh, calculate uh, supernova yields of the first stars based on our model 
to feed uh, observed elemental abundance patterns of the largest compilation of uh, extreme millimeter posters. So uh, as a result of our analysis, we found that the majority of extreme millimeter posters were best explained with uh, supernova explosions of uh, the first stars with masses less than 40 solar masses, which leave, beh leave behind a compact remnant, either a neutron star or a black hole with a few solar masses. So uh, this, uh, uh, our uh, results uh, demonstrate strengths of uh, metal pore stars as a probe of the super, uh, uh, nature of the first stars and their supernova explosions. And uh, the analysis, when analysis is applied to the data obtained by upcoming uh, stellar spectroscopic surveys of the Milky Way, this will have important impact in better understanding the uh, environment in the universe and also stellar mass black holes uh, produced after the supernova explosion of the first dust. So for more details, please come to my poster. Thank you. Okay, so my title is the Geography of Algebraic Varieties. So, so one goal of the algebraic geometry is to, start, to classify algebraic varieties. And how do we do that? We, we just study the environments. And so the title, uh, the geography in my title we just means the study of the relation between uh, the environments. Uh, so, so what kind of environments I'm interested in? So, so I, will, I am working uh, on birational geometry. So, so I'm interested in uh, so-called birational environments. So there are two basic uh, environments uh, we are interested in. One is the geometry genius, so which is defined just by the uh, dimension of the global section of the uh, canonical shift. And uh, the other is the canonical volume, which is defined by the, uh, the growth of the uh, plurigenius. genus. So, so we are interested in the relation between these two environments. Uh, and uh, so we are interested in the uh, projective smooth variety of general type, which means that uh, the volume is uh, positive. Okay, so, uh, so let, let, let's uh, see what happens in lower dimension. So, so this is a complex dimension. So in, in dimension one, so we have the, uh, this is well known that uh, the volume is just uh, two times the genus minus two, and this is just a special case of uh, Lima theorem. And in dimension two, so uh, we, have, uh, we don't have uh, equality, but we have two very nice uh, inequality. So one is the consequence of Miyaka Yao inequality, so which says that uh, the volume is bounded from above by this nine times uh, pre, uh, the genus plus one. And the other is the lower bound, which, uh, which called the uh, uh, northern inequality, and uh, uh, it says that the volume is uh, bounded from below by two times the uh, genus minus four. So, so then uh, one may want to generalize this. Uh, so, so we are interested in uh, to generalize this northern inequality into higher dimension. So under the framework of the minimum model program, so we can finally uh, show the following. So. So in dimension three, so this is the joint work uh, in progress with uh, Rong Kai Chen and Meng Chen. So we, we show that in dimension three, if uh, the particle genus, uh, no, no, sorry, uh, if the geometry genus is bigger than uh, 26, then we have the following form of the northern inequality. And uh, I won't say that uh, the, uh, so far we are still working on it, and uh, uh, so this is not the best possibility. So if we replace this for, uh, 14 in the, uh, in the inequality by 10, then, uh, then this, uh, this inequality becomes the best inequality, uh, and we have an example for the equality case. And, uh, okay, thank you for your attention. I'm Shinsuke Maeda. Uh, I will talk something about supercoma field theory. And actually, this work is a, a supersymmetric extension of what 
Susanne、uh, taught us today. Okay, so I'm studying quantum field series with conformal symmetry and supersymmetry, which is so called super c o m o r p h i s And it is often the case that they are strongly coupled and perturbative calculations are useless. So it is very important to find a way of computing physical observables in such theories. As Susanna taught us today, it was shown that in a conformal field theory with global symmetry, the sector of large global church can be studied perturbatively by an effective field theoretical method on a special two sphere, or in D dimensional, or special D mass one sphere. Uh, especially in super conformal field theories with rich flat modular space or v a c u a we predict that the sector of large R charge is described by a free field theory with correction suppressed by the inverse of R charge. From the effective field theory at large charge density, we can make a number of predictions for physical observables in the sector of large g o b a l charge. As a concrete example, let us take a 3D three dimensional super c o m a fixed point、uh, obtained by、uh, starting with、uh, three free c o l o r superfields XYZ and giving them a superpotential W equals XYZ. In this theory, we predict that the dimension of the third west operator of a given large E1R charge J is given by J plus 2 minus kappa over J cubed plus. Uh, terms more suppressed by J. And this number kappa is、uh, unknown, and we don't know how to compute this constant kappa, but we can show that this kappa must be neg non negative because、uh, negative kappa would be inconsistent with unitarity of the theory. And、uh, since time permits, let me present another prediction, which is about、uh, two point functions and the A anomaly coefficient、uh, of a、uh, common anomaly in four dimensional n equals two, SU2, SQCD with four flavors.、Uh, we predict this、uh, object involving、uh, two point functions.、Uh, it's going to negative four when. N equals very large. And,、uh, and the exact calculation using supersymmetric localization seems to agree with our prediction. And this is the plot for、uh, at the self dark point tau equals i. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I was going to start、uh, by saying something about.、Uh, Lagrangians, but Yuji's talk has kind of put me off doing that. So, <laughs> so let me start、uh, with this. You're all here. We're all, in fact, here. We're stuck in the maze that is our universe. And what we want to do is we want to find a path to this pagoda here. This is a deeper theory, a truer underlying theory of nature. So, how do we do that? Well, What we do is we build experiments. And what experiments do is they just explore the immediate vicinity around us in this maze of the universe.、Um, and what we're really looking for is we're looking for some big sign that points us along one direction rather than other directions. So, for instance, at the LHC, the LHC is exploring some region around us in energy. And what we would hope, hope for is some new particle to be produced. And this would be like a big neon sign with a big neon arrow that points us down one particular direction to go towards this truer theory of nature.、Uh, unfortunately, there have been no obvious signposts so far.、Uh, and so the question is what do we do now? Well, what we do is we have to be more careful. We have to look for a more, make a more careful map of our immediate、uh, vicinity. And when we make a map, we have to make a sort of little local coordinate system. And with experimental data, The making of this map and this local coordinate system is what's called effective field theory. Now, work that I've been doing with Hitoshi and、uh, with Brian Henning and x i a o x u a n Liu,、uh, we're, we're all theorists, so we don't have to be constrained to this experimental vicinity where we, we can consider the entire maze.、Uh, so, we're asking a question what can we understand about this full maze in general? 
And actually, we know some things about this maze. We know that it has to obey some basic principles, some basic principles of space-time uh, symmetry. And so we've actually found some very beautiful properties of this maze. Um, and what that can do, well, there's one reason for doing that, is that actually it turns out that creating a little coordinate system here, a little local coordinate system, is a bit tricky. Some of the coordinates, understanding their dependencies and the independences of each other is a, is a tricky business. And so understanding the full structure of the maze actually helps with this. this. The full structure gives us insight as to how to systematically construct a little local coordinate system. But you can also, this approach, you can ask a different question. And you can say, well, is it important that there are little structures here in this maze? There's a kind of five-point little, uh, little uh, circle here. There's some bridges. Are those important? Uh, can these kind of structures tell us anything about, uh, uh, about the theory? And let me leave it as a little teaser. You can come and ask me at my poster. You know, are there any deep underlying patterns uh, that you can find using this, this new approach? OK, thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Surud More, and uh, I'm going to tell you about the splashback radius or the edge of a dark matter halo. Uh, edges and boundaries are concepts that everyone in this room can understand, right? And fortunately, the edges of dark matter halos have been very ill-defined for a long time in the literature. So my poster addresses three very simple questions. Do dark matter halos have boundaries? Are they physically interesting in some manner? And the third question is, can they actually be observed uh, in nature? Right? So here's a, a simple picture that I wanted to show you. These are two dark matter halos from numerical simulations of about cluster scale objects, right? And uh, the question is, where would you assign the halo boundary? Even if you don't know anything, would you assign it at the outer circle, or would you assign it at the inner circle? So let me take a quick poll. How many of you think that you should assign it at the outer circle? Raise your hands. How many of you think that it should be at the inner circle? Quite a few. Democracy uh, doesn't always work in science, but at least in this case, I found that uh, most of you said that it should be at the outer circle. And the reason for this is that your eye is picking up a sharp drop-off in the density profile of these objects. Okay? And uh, the question that my poster addresses is where this physical feature is coming from. And it also tries to tell you that this physical feature can not only tell you about the mass of the dark matter halo, but it can also tell you something about its accretion rate, something which has been not uh, observable directly in nature. So once we uh, came up to, with these theoretical ideas from numerical simulations, we also decided to go look for it in real data. And voila, we actually found observational evidence for the existence of this sharp drop-off uh, in the density profile around, uh, around clusters. So this was uh, an observation which was done with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and uh, the interesting thing from this observation was that the location of this sharp drop-off was a little bit different from where we predicted it to be, right, from numerical simulations. So is this difference because of some systematics in the data? Or is it because of some interesting physical properties of the dark matter, such as self-interactions? These are things that we are currently exploring at IPMU, and I hope you'll come to my poster to learn more about it. Thank you. Hi, I, I'm Ryo Mamurata. Uh, I'm a graduate student at uh, Kabul IPMU and uh, the University of Tokyo. Uh, I'm working on cluster of cosmology, like uh, as uh, Sud. <laughs> uh, as Professor uh, David Spargel mentioned yesterday, uh, cluster of galaxies is a very interesting probe to constrain cosmology, including the nature of dark matter and the dark energy, and uh, the, the sum of neutral mass. But uh, we need to calibrate the cluster, cluster, cluster mass uh, using the number of red galaxies in cluster region uh, uh, to connect uh, with the theoretical model, uh, I mean simulation template. So then, so we de develop 
uh, new analysis method uh, to constrain the, the number of red galaxies and uh, cluster masses in stati statistical sense. So we use uh, good data from Sloan, Sloan, Sky, uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey and a good theoretical model from uh, my collaborator and, uh, and uh, good modeling. And uh, we applied it, applied it for uh, SDS data and uh, we, I found, uh, we, found, we showed that there is a good model to reproduce weak, weak gravitational lensing and uh, the abundance of observed class, uh, class of galaxies. So, oh, skip. <laughs> uh, oh, I added. it. <laughs> okay, but uh, we, I'm, I, we are applying this method for uh, the small uh, hyperspin comp data, which have a uh, higher redshift uh, class of galaxies. So, we are working to constrain uh, cosmology using it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Genki Ochi, a uh, postdoc at Kabri IPMU. Uh, I study mathematics, more concretely, algebraic geometry. Uh, I'm interested in symmetry of algebraic varieties. Uh, algebraic varieties are spaces described by finite number of algebra algebraic equations. Uh, especially, I study uh, algebraic varieties called K3 surfaces and hyperkähler manifolds. Uh, K3 surfaces are uh, known as two-dimensional Calabrian manifold, and uh, typical examples of hyperkähler manifolds can be constructed from K3 surfaces, uh, like modular space of vector bundles on K3 surfaces. Uh, I study K3 surfaces uh, using derived category of coherent shapes on uh, varieties. Uh, if we look at uh, automorphism groups of them, uh, we can find uh, rich symmetry uh, from derived categories or hyperkähler manifolds constructed from K3 surfaces. For example, uh, they are related to uh, finite sporadic simple groups called uh, Mashu group and uh, Conway groups. Uh, so I think it is interesting to study symmetry of algebraic varieties using derived categories. Uh, in the last year, uh, I studied complex dynamical aspect of symmetry of K3 surfaces uh, using derived categories. So I found an example of K3 surface X with a trivial automorphism group uh, such that it has a non-trivial derived automorphism uh, with positive categorical entropy. So positivity of entropy implies uh, its complex dynamical behavior is complicated and uh, in particular, this symmetry is not finite symmetry. And uh, I proved this derived automorphism induces an automorphism of modular space of some objects in derived category uh, and uh, uh, its topological entropy is positive. So this theorem claims that uh, even for complicated derived automorphism, uh, sometimes it has geometric meaning. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Charles Simpson. I'm uh, Mark Vagans' graduate student, um, one of those uh, students shared between Oxford and IPMU. And I'm going to talk about detecting pre-supernova neutrinos at uh, Super KGD. So you've seen a cartoon a bit like this before. This is definitely not to scale. But you've got a star leading up to a uh, core collapse towards the end of its life that's fairly heavy. And uh, the rate of fusion of hydrogen and helium isn't enough to keep it at its usual size. So it begins to contract. It gets a lot hotter. And heavier elements are fused at its core. And this leads to an increase in the flux and an increase in the energy of that flux, 
of uh, neutrinos and antineutrinos. Now, we're going to get a lot better at detecting antineutrinos at super KGD in future. Um, when we add the gadolinium, you heard about uh, the SKGD project from Mark earlier, and so we should be going ahead with that uh, over the next few years. The main uh, channel that would be detecting these pre-supernova neutrinos from is where you have a, uh, an electron antineutrino coming in, interacting with a proton, producing a positron and a neutron. The neutron will thermalize, capture on, a gadol on the gadolinium, produce a gamma ray cascade. Now, uh, the positron will be very low in energy. Uh, if you're lucky, it'll be right at the edge of what super K can detect. Um, if you're unlucky, you don't see it at all. And in that case, you'll just be looking for the gamma ray cascade, which has four or five MeV visible energy. So you need to use both of those categories of event where you have only the gamma ray cascade and where you have this uh, positron visible as well in order to get the most out of this technique. Now, I just want to emphasize the differences between these pre-supernova neutrinos and what people are usually talking about when they talk about supernova neutrinos. Uh, they're lower in energy. They're much earlier. Uh, they've never been detected before, but there's a lot less of them. And so you'd only be able to see them from a star that's close enough and heavy enough. So uh, probably less than a kiloparsec. So we've got a, uh, the example we usually give is Betelgeuse because it's near enough and heavy enough. Uh, so if I've piqued your interest, come and talk to me in the poster session. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Alessandro Sonnenfeld, and I'm going to be talking about a strong lensing project I'm working on. So very briefly, strong lensing happens whenever you have a light source like a galaxy that happens to lie in close proximity along the line of sight with a massive object, such as another galaxy. And when that happens, you can have multiple images of the same source, and you get things such as this image. And strong lenses are very useful. I'm mostly interested in using them to study the mass distribution of the lens galaxy, but they can also be used for cosmology, to look for substructure, or as cosmic telescope to study the background source in greater detail. Now, one of the reasons why I joined IPMU is to be able to work with hypersupreme cam. We heard yesterday from David Spurgel how great HSC is. It turns out it's also great to look for strong lenses. We expect order of a thousands strong lenses to be detected by the end of the survey. Now, the tricky part is to find them. So I developed a new uh, strong lens finding algorithm called Yatta Lens. Yatta Lens looks for blue arcs around red galaxies like this, and then fits, fits these candidates with the lens model. If the lens model provides a good fit, we keep the candidate. If not, like in this case, we throw it away. So with my collaborators, we apply Yatta Lens and two other lens finding algorithms to data from the first internal data release of the HSC survey. And just by looking at galaxies with BOSS spectroscopy, we were able to find 51 between definite strong lenses and highly probable strong lens candidates. And this is a these are 15 st definite strong lenses, new strong lenses that we discovered. Uh, we started spectroscopy follow-up. Now, finding, discovering a new lens is always exciting, but it's even more exciting when you take a spectrum and you can see from the spectrum that it is for sure a strong lens. Like in this case, this is an extruder spectrum. We put the slit like this. And here you can see multiply imaged H-alpha from Redshift 2-ish. So this is a spectroscopic, con <laughs> spectroscopic confirmation of these candidates. We're aiming to get to a sample of around 300 strong lenses by the end of the HSC survey. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do with this. 
One thing I'm interested in is constraining the evolution of the stellar IMF between redshift one and zero. But this sample can also, is also gonna be very useful in terms of getting an idea of things we'll be able to do with LSST or W first. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michi Satakeuchi, working on particle physics. In particle physics, there is two big unsolvable problems, which are the hierarchy problem and the existence of dark matter. Both problems indicate the existence of new particles around TB scale, and at, as LHC is a TB collider, it is the best place for such, for such new particle. Among them, our scalar top is one of the very motivated particles which is extensively searched for at the LHC, and the conventional search strategies relies on the missing momentum arising from the stop decay, and up to around one TB, the currently the stop is excluded. However, uh, it is known that uh, once the mass spectrum gets compressed, the sensitivity gets worse because the uh, uh, resulting missing momentum decreases. Uh, fortunately, there are a uh, well-known solution uh, for that problem, which is called the monojet. And for compressor stop pair production, by considering additional radiation, uh, we expect it as a source of monojet signature. And thanks to monojet searches, the compressor stop region is in additionally uh, covered. However, the monojet solution uh, confronts another problem. The problem is, uh, so whatever compressor spectrum predict, uh, for example, compressor gluinos and compressor squawks can also predict the same monojet signatures. So even though we observe monojet signatures, we cannot conclude they are from complex stops. And uh, uh, to solve this uh, problem, we pointed out a monotop a characteristic signature. Monotop would be useful. Monotop is expected through this diagram for compressed uh, stop cases. The important point is, unlike monojet uh, signature, monotop is only expected by compressor stops. So in the, my poster presentation, I will show the result uh, on monotop signature. Uh, in addition to that, uh, as there are various search strategies for new physics as the LHC, and many well motivated models predict uh, new physics signature in top sector, so I also present uh, the result, uh, how to find new physics effect in top sector through roof effects and flavor signatures in my poster presentation. Please come by my poster presentation. Uh, okay, so uh, today I will be um, actually presenting a poster on how the T2K neutrino flux can be constrained using some of the external hadron production data. Uh, so let me start with a brief introduction of the experiment. So as uh, probably all of you know, T2K stands for Tokai to Kamioka. It is a long baseline neutrino oscillation experiment located here in Japan. So uh, in Ibaraki, in Tokai Mura, we have the um, J-PARC, which is the proton accelerator used for producing the neutrino beam. And also uh, two near detectors are located there as well. Um, so this is over here. Then 295 kilometers away, we have our far detector. And this is Super Kamiokande. This is what we use for the far detector. Actually, this baseline length was chosen so as to maximize the oscillation probability of either uh, muon neutrinos or muon antineutrinos uh, into electron neutrinos and electron antineutrinos at this particular position. So my work deals with uh, reducing one of the dominant systematics actually for this analysis, and this is uh, how well we understand the neutrino flux. So we can understand why this is so challenging if we know how the neutrino flux is produced in the first place. So we have a proton beam hitting a 90 centimeter long graphite target. And what happens is uh, protons will be interacting with carbon nuclei in the target. Uh, in practice, we have uh, multiple reinteractions in the target until um, charged hadrons eventually leave the target. 
So what we do at T2K is we have a series of three magnetic horns which are used to focus the charged hadrons leaving the target, and then we wait for them to decay into neutrinos. So this is how we get the neutrino beam. And uh, since this is such a complicated process, we can't rely purely on the um, model that we have. So we can't use the nominal flux coming uh, from the model as um, uh, the flux used in the oscillation analysis. We uh, constrain the flux using external hadron production data. So if we look, for example, only one generation backwards from the neutrinos, if we look at what are the parent hadrons from the neutrinos, we can see that at low energies we are dominated by pion decays and at high energies by kaon decays. In practice, we want to constrain every interaction that led up to the final neutrinos. So currently what T2K does, it uses um, specially collected data by NA61 uh, with a two centimeter long, what we call a thin target. So NA61 for us collected data with a proton beam incident on this thin target, and they give us the multiplicities of charged pions beamed in terms of particle momentum and polar angle with respect to the incoming beam direction. So the T2K flux is peaked around 600 MeV. So here you can see we are in the range of uh, flux uncertainties of around 10%. So what I'm working on is developing a procedure for implementing a new data set, the so-called replica target data set. So here we have an exact replica of the T2K target, 90 centimeters long and made of the same material. And you can see preliminary results suggest a reduction of uncertainty to the level of 5%. So hopefully when this is fully done, T2K could have the best and most precisely known neutrino flux in the world, actually. Thank you very much. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Benda, and I'm working on the X-mass dark matter uh, experiment. So dark matter is one of the most outstanding question in uh, modern physics and astronomy. So a lot of evidence from the, uh, um, the galaxy uh, cluster rotation curve uh, to the gravitational lensing, uh, they're, they're all pointing to dark matter. But for uh, 80 years, uh, although many uh, brilliant people has uh, got innovative uh, ideas to test out this uh, idea to directly test uh, this hypothesis, uh, we still don't know a bit of the, uh, what the dark matter is. But uh, we, we all know that the dark matter is a stage of uh, uh, galaxy formation. So therefore, uh, in our galaxy, the dark matter uh, is stand still in the background while we are moving through the dark matter. So every second, the dark matter uh, will moving through our body. So one of the uh, possible idea to detect dark matter is let's suppose somehow uh, when we move through dark matter, it interacts with something we know, uh, so that there's a momentum transfer. Uh, for example, um, if we take one of the most uh, 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 best candidate of dark matter, a weak uh, interacting uh, massive particle, um, if it transfers momentum to some nucleus and the nucleus gets uh, recoil, then we can get some ionization uh, radiation so we can play with. And uh, so he, if we take the solar system as a reference frame, so we get a stream of uh, uh, dark matter flowing through. And while the Earth is moving around the sun, um, we, we sometimes go upstream and, and sometimes we go downstream. So therefore, uh, we, we can get a unique signature of dark matter um, if we are pursuing this process. So when I <laughs> practicing this talk with my friend, she, um, she asked, well, wait a minute, something looks not very correct. So I said, what? So she said, it looks like your net cannot catch that fish. <laughs> I said, well, that, that's why we need to build larger detectors. 
So uh, this is our detector, uh, the AXMAS. This is the unique detector in the world that uh, is a liquid scintillating uh, xenon detector with a single phase. So it is, uh, it is a colorimeter uh, with a position reconstruction by exploiting the uh, patterns in the surrounding uh, light detectors. And because we uh, need a very quiet in environment, so we put it underground uh, next to Super K as a smaller cousin. And uh, uh, by handling uh, the different uh, uniques of the background, which is radioisotopes uh, around this detector, uh, we come up with uh, many uh, ideas to suppress uh, this background. So please come to my uh, poster to check out more details. Thank you. Okay, my name is Kazuya Yonekura. Uh, this is about QCD phase transition, and this work is in collaboration with Hiroyuki Shimizu. So, uh, this is a picture of the expansion of the universe, and around the age of one microsecond, there was a phase transition of the universe due to quantum chromodynamics. And we then suggested that the dark matter might come from here. Unfortunately, this scenario is quite disfavored by numerical simulation, but still, very optimistically, this scenario might be realized. So anyway, so we IPMUs must study this phase transition of the universe uh, by using physics and mathematics. Why not? So I studied it with Hiroyuki. Uh, so physically, this, is, this system is a quantum chromodynamics. So we have color group and flavor group and quarks uh, sections of vector bundles with the structure group given by this group. Then in this theory, we can use a little bit of topological techniques from mathematics, such as obstruction theory of principal G bundles, which takes values in this cohomology, and also atia patel singer index theorem of Dirac operators. Now in QCD, there are uh, two characteristic phenomena, namely uh, deconfinement and chiral symmetry restoration. <coughs> Correspondingly, we have two, in principle, two critical temperatures. So one temperature is chiral phase transition temperature, which is very defined in massless quark limit, and also deconfinement temperature, which is subtle to define, but I don't explain this point. Now, our result is like this. So in theoretically idealized case with very defined critical temperatures, we have this inequality. So the deconfinement temperature is lower than or equal to the chiral phase transition temperature, and the equality is possible only for first order transition. So in theoretically very idealized situation, this, re this result prefers within the scenario of dark matter via QCD. Uh, that's all. Thank you.